Someone was buried in an avalanche one canyon over, and we had the ability to get there and, and possibly save their life. Okay, we do have a track who goes in. That sounds unquestionable. We don't want to put anybody in to this slope. We know now there's a lot of hang fire still above it. There's a lot of snow up there that can still slide. It was certainly a dangerous situation. Copy that. Let's mark the spot to um, proceed on the full-on avalanche search. Uh, I begin to shovel as if it's my companion there. Well, hey, you're in the moment, speaking like a maniac. Jackson Hole, Wyoming spreads out beneath the towering Tetons. And for centuries, it's offered a home where the bison roam. The Yellowstone buffalo are still here in numbers big enough to hunt. And you can find their images all over the town of Jackson, memorialized on the state flag and outside Bud's liquor store. Local pastures once grazed by bison are today fenced off. Wrangling isn't an easy way to make a living these days, but they still do it on the Lockhart Ranch, a handsome spread right in the center of town. Fifth generation local and search and rescue utility man, Cody Lockhart, does his ranching inside city limits, but is ready to spring into the backcountry. When you get a SAR call, it's like something's gonna happen. I'm either gonna you know, get on a snowmobile and go into the woods for the night, or I'm gonna jump on a helicopter or whatever the, the event may be. For Cody, volunteering on search and rescue is an extension of the ranching tradition. You've got to look out for your neighbors. This community needs SAR because things happen and, and someone has to be there to, to help them out. If you're in the mountains enough, you are going to have an incident, uh, whether it's your fault or, or just a, an act of God. Um, we're lucky enough to be able to be there to help people when, when they need it. These bulls are our pride and joy. Ranching is not necessarily a job, it's, it's a way of life. Times are changing and, and we're trying to, you know, have our business evolve with it. In Jackson, the role of the cowboy continues to evolve. As Cody not only wrangles cattle and delivers meat, he also works as a financial planner. My day job, I'm a financial advisor. Generally, when I'm sitting at my desk and I see that I have a star call, it, you know, I kind of smile inside and I'm excited to go run out the door. Cody and his search and rescue teammates expect a call out any day now, as the first big storm of winter moves in, bringing with it the start of avalanche season. Avalanches most often occur in early to mid-winter, as big dumps pile up quickly and create unstable backcountry conditions. Yeehaw, Jackson Hole. We proceed 17 inches of fresh snow. It just keeps coming, Jackson Hole. Over five days, a storm drops three feet of new snow on slopes just above town. Places like Glory Bowl and Pyramid Peak load up and trigger easily when crossed by someone exploring the backcountry. That puts search and rescue on high alert. Can you tell us if you 
update from the helicopter, please. So volunteer Jake Urban studies the Teton snowpack and alerts the community to danger zones as they develop storm by storm. It's really important that I get out and actually get out into the terrain and I have an idea of what the snowpack's doing. Jake patrols the Jackson Hole backcountry because he loves being out here. But he also does this to keep his community safe, including his teammates. Guys like Cody Lockhart, who Jake is often paired with on rescues. After many years in the saddle as a first responder with Cody and the rest of the team, Jake considers these folks family. This group of people is the greatest group of friends I would never make. There would be no reason for any of us to be in the same room together. But twice a month and up to about 90 times a year, we find a common cause. That's what makes this team. I'm going to push down on your pelvis. OK, you let me know if anything hurts. Uh, you know, ultimately, we have a fragile snowpack that rots out at the base, um, and then we get a heavy load on top of that. The entire search and rescue team relies on Jake to watch and study the snowpack, so everyone is fully aware of the constantly changing avalanche conditions. And if you just think of it from a structural standpoint, base of your foundation, um, you'd like it to be strong, and um, the base of our snowpack is not. The current snowpack isn't binding so it can fracture and slide on a thin layer of hoarfrost. This granular snow slips like ball bearings and accelerates downhill. You can see a couple of the different storm tracks. Three major events have consolidated down into three interfaces here. The reality is, is that we've got a sleeping dragon in the snowpack, and it's just a matter of somebody tickling that dragon. If you wake it up, it's, uh, it's gonna be ugly. Each winter, the team heads into avalanche season with one goal, keeping everyone alive in the backcountry. The person leading that charge is Jess King, the rescue coordinator and den mother, overseeing operations at the hangar. Uh, I would say in some ways we're trying to put ourselves out of a job to get our community educated to the point where um, they're safe in the backcountry, they're still getting out there, getting after it, but they're able to take care of themselves um, and make good decisions. The team's primary mission is to have zero deaths. So when people do get into trouble, Search and Rescue sends in its Avalanche Rescue Dream Team. We're going to take Cody with us, too. Jake and Cody. They specialize in the techniques on the bill for today's training. It's called short hauling, and it allows two-man rescue teams to swoop in and pluck injured people from difficult-to-reach slide paths. Giving the briefing about today's training operation is medical director A.J. Wheeler. Right now, our goal is to fly up and assist the mountain patrol. Short haul is a helicopter rescue technique where the helicopter has a rope suspended from the belly of it. Um, and at the end of that rope is a human being. Um, and that's one of our rescuers. So they are harnessed into the end of the rope. The 150-foot short haul line is made from the same polymer fibers that create everything from bulletproof vests to fishing line. Today, Jess will oversee short haul training. Yep, that's the plan. Uh, this is a chance for Cody and Jake to work on their communication with heli pilot Nicole Ludwig and spotter Chris Lee. Uh, there was a report of a slide on the pyramid. Can you guys fly over that and check it out? While the team wraps up training in an area called Rock Springs, practice suddenly gets real as a call comes in about an avalanche on nearby Pyramid Peak. Okay, we do have a track who goes in. That's uh, all questionable. Copy that. Let's mark the spot. Let's uh, proceed on the full-on avalanche search. Someone was buried in an avalanche one canyon over, and we had the ability to get there and, and possibly save their life. Okay, 
A reported avalanche near where Teton County Search and Rescue is training with its helicopter sends the team rushing to the scene. While back at the hangar, veteran volunteer Tim Seal Carlin steps in as incident commander, overseeing all parts of the rescue. Get those teams together. We just got a call out for an avalanche on what's called the pyramid. It's a pretty popular place to ski, rather steep and known for avalanche activity. The search and rescue heli flies a couple of drainages south to the scene of the reported avalanche. This time, if anyone was caught in the avalanche on Pyramid, they're incredibly lucky to have a helicopter searching from the air and Cody and Jake ready to fly in on a short haul line. This is their specialty. But up on Pyramid, the avalanche danger remains. I don't want to go into that avalanche path. Just looking to see if there's uh, anybody uh, around that area. Okay, we do have a track who goes in. That's um, all questionable. Copy that. Let's mark the spot. Let's, let's um, proceed on the full-on avalanche search. So Cody and I, the first thing that we want to do is get eyes on the victim. But as incident commander, Tim's primary job is keeping his rescuers safe. He doesn't want to send them into an active avalanche path. So while heli pilot Nicole Ludwig searches from above for signs of victims caught in the slide path, Jake and Cody stand by. We don't want to put anybody in to this slope. We know now there's a lot of hang fire still above it. Hang fire is snow left at the top or crown of an avalanche that is unstable and could still slide. So Tim orders the heli to scan the slope with an avalanche beacon. It's a high power avalanche beacon that hangs below a helicopter. If we get a tone and we get a beacon hit, we'll know where to look. If anyone caught in this slide was wearing an avalanche transceiver, then the helicopter's beacon will pick up electromagnetic signals broadcast every few seconds. The heli beacon operates like ground penetrating radar as it sweeps over the slope looking for signs of life buried in the snow. Then suddenly, the beacon registers a signal. We're going to go there and get staged and get ready to assist these folks and at least get eyes on our people on this slide path. Okay, we are their only backup right now. Tim rushes to set up a command post at the Pyramid Peak Trailhead. While the heli flies to pick up Jake and Cody. Medical specialists stand by to assist. Uh, Nicole, um, okay. we can stay where we are at this LZ. You know, 30 minutes is ideal to dig somebody up. Less than 30 minutes for an avalanche victim for chance of survival, so. We're pushing it to try and get people out there safely. In the heli is spotter Chris Lee. He's the team's eyes in the sky. So he gives Jake and Cody a quick heads up about what to expect. Jake said, let's just draw a map on the snow. I drew a map on the snow of the scene. And then we just made a unified decision. We were going as two groups and we would take Jake and Cody in first. And we decided we'd go in, we'd have them, we'd put them in, they would have to skin up to the slide zone. We'll circle around and then we'll come back to the spot. If you don't like it, tell us that. Okay, why don't we just fly and look? Okay. By the time Jake and Cody take off, it's been more than 45 minutes. And they're still unsure where to drop in. But then, the heli spots another clue. Okay, Tim, there is somebody. Uh, we just found a snowboard at the very end of the slide. Nicole, is that person alone? We only see a snowboard upside down in the slide. Nicole takes us on a big lap around. Jake and I were kind of just talking. You can only talk so much when you're flying under a helicopter at 50 miles an hour or whatever. Um, and you know, I think we both nodded. So this is going to happen, we're going, and I see the snowboard sticking out of the snow. You know, Nicole put us down kind of in the only spot she, she really could. Jake and Cody are on the ground and on the run at the bottom of an avalanche path that could slide again. Teton County search and rescue first responders, Jake Urban and Cody Lockhart, 
make tracks towards a snowboard spotted in avalanche debris. It's been more than an hour since the slide, and one or more victims might be buried. As I approach the board uh, that's protruding through the snow, uh, it becomes very apparent that somebody is attached to it. I begin to shovel as if, as if it's my companion there, which is pretty rapidly. Well, he is in a moment, speaking like a maniac. On scene, um, Cody is actually set back a little bit in the trees. There's a lot of snow up there that could still slide. You know, it's not, it's not done. Talked it through and it's like, Jake, you go start digging there. I see something coming off the cliff above us. I'll scream at you to get out of the way. It was certainly a dangerous situation. As I'm digging, it's also becoming very apparent that the victim has suffered a tremendous amount of trauma uh, in, the, in the process of the slide. From the incident command post down at the Pyramid Peak Trailhead, Tim mobilizes a team to search for anyone who might have survived the slide and skied out. He also orders medical specialists to fly into the location of the victim as quickly as possible. Anybody uh, responding? We have an hour and 29 minutes since the event occurred. Okay, it's an hour and 29 minutes. Cody echoes Tim's call for sending in medical support, asking for two more rescuers and a stretcher, known as a litter, for pulling people out of the backcountry. Cody, on uh, Sora Pete, can uh, that be two people plus litter? Two people plus litter would be good. Rescue coordinator Jess King helps volunteer John Weedy and medical director Dr. A.J. Wheeler prepare for their flight into the scene. Yep, A.J. and Weedy are, yep, and they have the litter. As a physician entering that scene, ultimately uh, the decision falls on me that yes, we can recover and unbury somebody still alive. John and AJ unhook from the short haul line, then use special climbing skis to travel uphill to the patient. Back down at the trailhead, the team paces anxiously. There are cases where people have survived a long time, so we're just waiting to hear back at this point. Teton County Search and Rescue's medical team is airborne and headed into the backcountry to assist with the rescue of a snowboarder caught in an avalanche. We short hauled into a, a small meadow that was right next to the avalanche slide in a safe zone, um, which was the same area where Jake and Cody were inserted. I continue to dig and eventually able to free the victim from the snow. Um, at this time, um, I request Cody to come over uh, and we work together in order to uh, pull the victim out of the slide path and get him into a secure area. At the same time, Dr. A.J. Wheeler and short haul specialist John Weedy speed to the scene so the patient receives immediate care. As a physician entering that scene, even though um, I train with our first responders and EMTs extensively on assessing these patients in the backcountry, ultimately uh, the decision falls on me in assessing the victim uh, and then to help extract the, the victim. Volunteers at the trailhead finish a sweep of the area and determine the snowboarder caught in the slide was traveling alone. As the heli returns to the trailhead, news comes in. The snowboarder didn't make it. We have dug the patient out as quickly as possible, removed them from the slide path, but uh, injuries were very traumatic. A 30-year-old Jackson local pays the ultimate price for snowboarding into avalanche terrain. It happens just above town in a place where members of the team have skied before. So this one hits close to home. He basically went into the snowpack at an angle. So, okay. so snowboard here, legs like this. When the slide broke loose on Pyramid Peak, it hit speeds of more than 70 miles per hour as it dragged the snowboarder through trees and over cliffs. That's why one in four avalanche victims die of blunt force trauma. I, I don't think he survived the slide. I, I think he was dead before the snow stopped moving. Rescues are a big deal to us, and we take it really personally when we go there and there's a fatality. It hurts us. It really does knock the wind out of our sails. 
had the individual just waited a couple of days and let the snowpack stiffen up, um, this, this occurrence probably wouldn't have, wouldn't have happened. You know, some people are very stoic and, and handle the situation amazingly well. Other people, you know, don't want to take them off guard. Um, so so we, we, we don't have much training, or I personally don't have much training on how to deal with people dying. If we learn from each and every one of them, we will be safer. It may take time, but we will be better for it. You guys are doing a nice job. Yeah.